This might be one of the most hot button videos that I've made. Watch to the end to find out why. Hi Sodbusters. Eight days ago, I inspected the conversion hive. I had some concerns because of a reduction in traffic at the entrance of the hive. And upon that inspection, I discovered a condition called sac brood. For those who are unfamiliar with sac brood, it's a condition that affects the larvae of the honeybee and it prevents the larvae from going into the pupae stage. And it has a characteristic that the larvae will lay inside of the cell with their mouth parts up and kind of forming a slipper shape inside of the cell. Eventually, the outer skin of the larvae will become kind of a thick membrane and the inside liquefies and so it becomes a sac of liquid, which is why it's called sac brood. Now, sac brood is not a terrible honeybee disease most healthy hives can overcome it. Because of that, and not wanting to do a brood break this close to winter, which is generally about the only thing that a beekeeper can do to help combat sac brood, I decided to let the bees see if they could overcome it. So here we are eight days later. I'm going to open up this hive and see how the brood of this hive is doing. I will say the traffic at the entrance has not improved. In fact, maybe it's gotten a little slower. So that may be a little bit of concern, or it may just be part of this little temporary setback, and maybe we'll find some reason for hope inside the hive. So let's get into it and see what we find. The last time I opened this hive, even though I saw issues with the brood in the late larvae going into pupa stage, I did see a lot of eggs and young larvae. So that gives me some hope. And as we open up the hive today, I'm hoping to find that a significant amount of that young larvae has been capped. The alternative is we may find a lot more larvae being affected by the sac brood. And if that's the case, we may have to make some other plans to try to combat that. At last inspection, this first frame was full of honey and nothing different about that. This next frame, I believe, was also all honey for the most part and some bee bread. And if I recall correctly, this third frame is where we started to see some brood. Oh, maybe not, just a lot of bee bread on there. Sometimes my memory isn't the best. That's one benefit of these videos for me is that I can go back and look at the videos to remind me of what I had seen before. Right, now we're into some brood. There isn't a lot of cap brood on here and I'm also not seeing a lot of young brood in here. I am seeing a little evidence of sac brood. I see one larvae that is uncapped and has its mouth up in that characteristic pose. I see another larvae that is partially uncapped. On this other side, we have more brood. Again, seeing some capped brood, but also seeing some that's been uncapped, showing signs of sac brood, and not seeing a lot of young larvae inside the empty cells. And while I would like to see more larvae right now, because these bees are going to need a population to get through winter, if these bees kind of go through their own brood break here, that could help to address the sac brood issue. Not seeing much, but then there's my queen right in the middle there. So, I don't know if you'll see her on camera, she's right there. So I'll be careful with this frame. On this back side, there's very little happening here in terms of brood. I do see a few young larvae, but otherwise very little brood on there. And not much cap brood on this side either. Now there's a little more cap brood on this side, as well as this other side. But I am still seeing some uncapped brood and kind of that characteristic pose. The good news is that I'm seeing more capped cells than uncapped cells. I also am seeing some young larvae on this frame, but the fact that I'm seeing those may just mean that I'm not seeing the ones the bees have already removed. Seeing a few young larvae on this side. So it appears that the bees are still trying to overcome the situation. And a little more cap brood here. And then we're getting into honey frames. All right, so I don't know if I was really expecting a miracle here or what. Was looking for some good news, obviously. Not seeing anything yet that makes me terribly hopeful. The fact that there is some cap brood that seems to be healthy. And what I mean by that, obviously I can't see under the capping to know what's going on, but when the larvae dies after it's capped, then that capping will typically become concave. 
in other words it'll kind of sink in a little bit and of the cap cells that I saw they all seem bumped out in a healthy way so that looks good but it may just be such a thing that they kind of have to go through that brood break caused by the disease in order to combat the disease and this isn't the time of year I'd like to see them go through it in fact it's most typical that uh, this occurs in the spring as they're really producing a lot of brood and building up but if they have to go through it they have to go through it one other thing that I could do and I've considered is uh, requeening this hive and I actually have a resource hive that has an extra queen for those who followed my attempts to get a queen in the Langstroth hive you probably saw that my last attempt on that was to purchase a queen but when I purchased that queen I actually purchased two and so I put that other queen that second queen in a uh, Layens hive with a few bees just to take care of her and so I do have that other queen that I could swap with the queen from this hive and that's a possibility and I've considered doing that but I checked on that hive today and they're actually doing pretty good I think rather than go through swapping the queens with the risk that one of the hives might reject the queen since this hive is still producing brood it's not yet overall healthy brood but in time they may overcome that and once we get into winter they're going to go through a brood break anyway once that happens we should be able to come into spring without any issues so I think we'll just take a wait and see approach hope for the best with this hive I'll keep checking on them they have plenty of honey resources it's just a matter of will they have enough bees to carry them through winter so that's the big question now I wish I could have brought some groundbreaking great news for you today sometimes things are a slow go and we'll just see what happens the situation in this hive might be frustrating but it can also be illustrative for many beekeepers watching this you're probably wanting to ask a question that's very common whenever discussions of honeybee diseases comes up what's the mite count as I've mentioned in other videos I keep bees using natural methods which includes the avoidance of treatments this follows the practices taught in the book keeping bees with a smile including methods taught by dr. Leo Sharashkin based on research by dr. Thomas Seeley and following the example of other more experienced natural beekeepers such as Les Crowder so when it comes to mite counts the simple answer is I don't know one primary key factor for natural beekeeping is to use local bees preferably from feral colonies most of my hives have been populated from such local bees either from trap outs cutouts or caught swarms there is one exception though and that's the bees in the conversion hive those bees were given to me by a keeper who practices conventional methods it's extremely likely that these bees are from cultivated stock rather than from local feral stock now one case doesn't prove a point but it can provide a comparative example of the possible difference that local feral bees can make it can be controversial in beekeeping circles to suggest that feral bees unlike their commercially raised cousins can have increased varroa or disease resistance but a study published in 2015 found that the population of honeybees in the Arnott forest in New York State is the same now after the introduction of varroa mites into the US as it was in 1978 well before varroa came into the country a comparative study wasn't done in the 1990s but it's generally accepted that feral colonies were decimated by varroa mites during that time period besides showing population recovery the study also did an in-depth genetic study of these honeybees and found that the feral populations now have a much more limited genetic diversity than the populations in the 1970s did this suggests that this repopulation came about 
from a small number of colonies that had developed traits for resistance to Varroa. Dr. Thomas Seeley has continued research into these colonies and the effect that Varroa resistance has had on their survival rates. He found that the summer and winter survival rates of these current colonies is the same as it was in the late 1970s, even though the current colonies are generally infected with Varroa. These studies have shown that these current colonies have an increased ability to live with Varroa, and there's no reason to think that this result can't be extrapolated to other parts of the country. So while I'm not making a claim that this proves anything about my specific case, it is interesting that the one colony I have, which is from cultivated stock, is suffering while the rest of my colonies from feral stock are active and robust. And while all this research about varroa resistance doesn't necessarily apply specifically to sac brood, there is one thing that I didn't share with you while I was doing this inspection. And that's that I noticed a couple bees that were suffering from deformed wings. And that is very often caused by a virus that's carried by varroa. So what now? I want to promote and propagate bees with strong genetic traits towards mite and disease resistance. I hope that this hive will show itself strong enough to overcome its current situation. But if not, if this hive is lost, then that will mean culling out the weaker genetics and increasing the overall strength of my apiary. I put a lot of time and effort into this colony, but protecting my investment in this colony is not as important as the long-term overall improvement of the genetic strength of my entire apiary. If you're interested in learning more about the research that I referenced, I'll post citations and links in the description of this video. I do hope that you found this interesting and informative, even if you don't entirely agree with all of my methodologies. I do plan to post videos in the future going more in-depth into natural beekeeping, so I hope you'll subscribe so you don't miss out on those. In the meantime, I encourage you to check out this video that Google has selected especially for you. I do thank you for watching and I will see you next time.